Okay, so that's the MP3 going. That should hopefully be the lecture going. How much time have we lost? Ten minutes. Sorry, uh, could I just do a quick catch up? Just a couple of seconds. Sure, no problem. He wasn't joking, was he? That man's a fish. <laughs> okay. Let's just check we're checking, getting sound through. Because the last, uh, I've screwed up the sound on a couple of lectures. And my new rig up is supposed to avoid that. Look at that. Cool, that's what you see. Now, does it... Uh -oh. Yeah, I can hear my computer talking back at me. Yeah. Sweet. Okay, good. Okay, good. <laughs> you okay? Ah, it's funny, look, it closes at each one. Come on. Ah, oh, quit. Yeah. All right, got it, good, okay. Right. Only a mere 20 minutes late, sorry. Um, so what I wanted to really talk about today is uh, basis functions. Um, we talked last time about um, making, um, doing linear regression and dealing with uh, systems where uh, you have a linear input, multiple dimensions, and you've got a set of parameters, and we made a Bayesian treatment of the parameters. Now, what are basis functions? This is a way of making it nonlinear. And it relates, so Trevor talked about kernels, I think, in the support vector machine lecture. And uh, this is really closely related to kernels. I mean, we'll not see immediately, but it, as, as we develop, I'll, I'll give pointers as to how, how you get into kernels. Um, so in the basis function idea, what you say is that instead of operating your linear regression directly in the input space x, you first take your inputs and you map them with functions using nonlinear functions to a different space, and then you do your work in that. So we've already done that, actually, because remember how we were introducing C in the one-dimensional regression? We were actually saying, well, if we have another extra input, which is just constant, then um, we can use that. And so instead of saying mx plus C, we say W transpose x, where x1 is always 1, and x2 is what x was before, yeah? So that's actually the basis function idea, but it's just a really uninteresting basis function. It's just a constant one. So we can extend that idea and take any nonlinear function of x. And in fact, this is exactly what uh, Gauss was doing when he was trying to plot the trajectory of series. He was trying to, he was working out what the basis, the correct basis functions were using Newton's laws, and then he was fitting those basis functions to data. So the basis, for, it wasn't just linear input because Newton's laws told him what the path of the um, planet should be. Um, they also did this some nice work. So uh, there was some work in the 19th century, early 19th century, and Laplace looked at this, which was, um, they knew that, well, they could work out how the moon was affecting the tides, the equations of motion for that, and do all the tide prediction. But then it made them think, well, uh, what about air pressure? Is air pressure affected by the moon in the same way? So it's an interesting question, because it's also a fluid around the Earth. Um, and then they tried to fit. They worked out what the equations of motion would be, and they tried to fit uh, these equations of motion to the level of air pressure in Paris. Now they couldn't see any effect, because the problem is air pressure is affected by so many other things, the sun and winds and everything, that any effect from the moon, it was so small that it was being washed out by that. But I believe it's the case that recently they discovered there is a slight tidal effect on air pressure. I mean, it's so small as to be irrelevant, but I think that you can show that there is a very small tidal effect on air pressure. So it's a sort of interesting question they were asking once they knew Newton's law. So here's a second, an, another basis. So what do we mean by basis functions? Well, we've already been looking at a basis function that's like this. Uh, phi of x is equal to 1. So it's not a function of x. So instead of taking x directly, we just take x equals to 1. 
Now, another basis would be 5x is equal to x. Now, taking these two bases here is what we've been doing for linear regression. We've been adding, so what I want you to see is we've been adding a constant function, some weighting of a constant function, to a weighting of uh, a linear function, so twisting around like that. And adding those two things together gives us a prior distribution over linear regressions. But we could add something else. We could add a quadratic term. So this is a quadratic basis. So we're saying 5x is equal to x squared. Now this is very popular to fit polynomials. So people do this all the time. Um, they do it in, uh, I think it's quite widely used in uh, sort of CAD systems. And there's a lot of interest in, in fitting polynomials to data. In machine learning, we don't do it much. Why don't we do it? Well, OK, I'll tell you in a moment. But let me just show you what sort of things you can get. So. Here we need three weights for each of these basis functions. W1 for the constant basis, W2 for the linear basis, and W3 for the quadratic basis. Now, what if I sample from a Gaussian, which is what I've done here, you can see that we've got W1 here is 0.87, W2 is minus 0.3835, and W3 is 2 point something. Uh, adding those three together, so now we've got the red one weighted by 0.87, the line weighted by uh, 0.38835, and then the blue one rated by minus 2. Uh, sorry, this blue one here weighted by minus 2. So what we see is the quadratic has been turned upside down. It's doubled in its size because it's been weighted by minus 2. The linear term is um, also shifting now. Look, you see this quadratic is symmetric here, yeah? But now look at this quadratic here. It's twisted down in this direction because the linear term has also had a negative weight applied, so it's also upside down. And it's been weighted by 0.3, so less than the quadratic term, so it's dominated by the quadratic term. And then the constant offset has got a slight positive weight, so instead of going through zero where the quadratic and the linear term go, this thing goes through about 0.87. Yeah, just here. So those three terms adding together are giving us a nonlinear function. It's quite easy, isn't it? <coughs> now, all you have to do is say, instead of working with your inputs directly, you work with this feature space. So people sometimes think of this as a feature space, but with these basis functions. Here's another example where the quadratic term is much smaller. It's still negative, so you get a slight curve. Again, we've got, uh, now we've got a minus term on the uh, constant, so we're going slightly through the, the origin in a negative place. And we've got a positive term on the linear, so we're going up with this slight concave curve, yeah? So those three weights are operating in that way. Here's another example, and in this example, uh, we've got quite a large positive weight on the quadratic, so we're seeing mainly the quadratic coming through. We've got a negative weight on the linear term, so instead of being skewed the way we were before, we're going skewed uh, down. And we've got a negative weight on the bias, so look where we're crossing the zero. The origin is about minus five. Why do I talk about the origin? Because obviously the, other, the contribution of the other two functions at this point are both zero, because x uh, is zero if x is zero, and x squared is zero if x is zero. So the only thing contributing when x is zero is this constant bias, just as it was in the linear case. Now, what's wrong with this picture? Well, uh, nothing's wrong with this picture because I drew it, but uh, what's wrong with the global picture? Um, there's a problem with, uh, with using polynomials. They are not good things to use. Why? Can anyone think why they're not good things to use for fitting data? They've got some lovely properties, but yeah, Stuart? I'm guessing the mass gets part of the aggregators. That's all right, actually. No, the mass does. It, it actually do, goes up. So uh, Stuart's comment was, does the mass get harder for the higher degree? Well, interestingly, what happens is you add the degree of the polynomial. You're just fitting an extra parameter. And so you just get, uh, in your matrix manipulations, an extra dimension. So, so that's all right. Um, the big problem with polynomials is look at the range where I'm showing them, minus 1 to 1. They're quite well behaved here. If we want lots of inflections in the polynomial, if we want it to bend up and down all over the place, then we do have to go for high degree polynomials, like Stuart said. But what happens to high degree polynomials as you leave minus one to one? Yeah, 
I won't repeat that on the video. Um, so, if we say A is equal to lin space, I don't know, naught to 20, um, so, sorry, we say that X, and then we'll say um, Y is equal to, uh, so we'll say capital X is equal to, um, 1's 20 comma 1, x, so I'm just setting up the basis here, x squared, x cubed, x to the 4, so this is a quartic, so we're adding, so you see what I'm doing by setting up the basis, when I press return you'll just get, oh, you'll get an error, <laughs> what have I done wrong there? Uh, sorry, yeah, the lin space command is a, uh, I didn't give the number of data. Okay, so what's going to happen? You already could have seen it in that uh, plot there. So now we're going to do uh, uh, a weight matrix, which I'm just going to sample from the Gaussian density with constant um, noise. So I'm going to make it a row vector, and then I'll go x times, where's that going to work? X? Ah, because I've done the wrong size, haven't I? One, two, three, four, five, sorry. Not four. Uh, X, so that's N times five times uh, W transpose. Okay. So now I can plot against X what I've got. So just to go through that again, what I've done is set um, an input. Just The in space just gives me uniform points between 0 and 20, 100 of them. So if I show you those, you'll just see those are points going up. Then I'm building, uh, well, let's not call that x, let's call that phi, because this is typically what we use. Phi is our basis function. So the first 100 basis functions are constant, just one. The next 100 basis functions are x. The next 100 basis functions are x squared. The next are x cubed. The next x to the power of 4. Um, then the next thing I'm going to do is sample this... Uh, Weights. So these are the weights of each basis function we're going to use. So why don't we just display them as well? So the constant terms multiplied by 0.08, the linear term minus 7 point, uh, 0.74, and the quartic term is minus 0.34, and you can see the others. Okay. So now what we'll do is go y is equal to phi. Let's try getting the equal sign. Phi times w transpose. Uh, and that's going to give my result. And now I'll do plot x comma y. Can anyone tell me how this is going to look as we go towards the right? We started at zero, and what's going to happen as we go right? Which term in the quartic is going to dominate as x increases? So you can see the weights x x to the 4, precisely, x to the 4 is going to dominate in this sum. He's got this minus 0.34 weight here, and as we go large, at the top, it's going to be x to the power of 20, minus, times minus 0.34. X, uh, sorry, 20 to the power of 4, times minus 0.34. So, of course, when we plot it, <laughs> minus 5,000. So it's completely dominated by this quartic term. Now, if we make, if we keep x in this range, then do the same computation again. Oh, yes. Good spot. That would have been confusing for me when <coughs> it didn't come out. That's much nicer, isn't it? Exactly the same function, exactly the same weights, but we've restricted the range to where? Minus 1 to 1. Polynomials are lovely, nice, beautiful functions in minus 1 to 1, but as you start going very large, they just do crazy things. 
they're super sensitive to that, you know, in order to stop it doing that dominant cortic term, you would have to have a very small weight on it. And then if you've got a very small weight on the cortic term, then you're not going to do anything interesting in the inside, you know, in the minus one to one range. So you get this very uh, annoying behavior as you move out of that range. So unless you can actually force your data to move into that range, then polynomials are typically pretty bad. Um, in practice, of course, there would be some uncertainty associated with these weights. But as you saw more and more data, um, and you was, if you were looking at the posterior distribution, you'd see more and more confidence outside this one region that the function was actually flying off towards infinity. Uh, not, well, going off as x to the fourth or either positively or negatively, but just depending on you know, small changes in where the data are here. I mean, it's not justified in making that assumption. So polynomials have lots of nice properties. For example, the derivative of a polynomial is also a polynomial. The integral of a polynomial is also a polynomial. So they're very good for solving differential equations. But they are not good models of data. Um, you'll see them used a lot because of their properties, but they're not good models of data. Here is a much more sensible thing to do. Um, so in this case, what we've got is a, a radial basis function. So what you can do is set up these are little Gaussians. They're not Gaussians because they're not probability distributions, but they have a Gaussian form. So it's a little bit confusing that you see this Gaussian form appearing again, but really the, could, there's lots of other forms people could use for this. People tend to use this a lot because it's got some nice analytic properties, just as the Gaussian density does. But the fact it looks like a Gaussian is unrelated to the probability distributions. It doesn't need to be a probability distribution, these basis functions. We've just seen that. The polynomials aren't. So these Gaussian basis functions, um, Here's one that's centered on uh, minus one, so it's mu is minus one, and it has a width of four, uh, so a width of L is two, uh, sorry, L is, uh, oh, I've got that in the wrong place, there may be an error there, because it's width, we can see the width is approximately, I don't know, half, yeah, that makes sense, doesn't it? L squared would be then four. Uh, 1 over L squared would be 4, yeah. So the width is half, actually. So that is right. <coughs> so we've got a one basis function here. Now, what we need to do is cover the space that we're interested in in other basis functions. Okay, like that? So now you've got three bumps, and you can use these bumps together to form functions. So, again, what I'm doing here is showing you some weighting of these three basis functions. So in this case, the red one here has a negative weight, uh, the purple one also has a negative weight, and the blue one has an even larger negative weight. So we've chosen three basis functions, and we've placed their means at minus 1, 0, and 1, and we've given them a, a width, an L parameter, which is like the standard deviation in the Gaussian, but it's just giving us the width here of 0.5. Um, so here's some other examples. So you can get these sort of functions that do these slightly interesting things. You know, they move around, and depending on how many you've given, it shows how many bumps you could have. Uh, they don't, as you move out of the area in which they're defined, go off to infinity, they, they go back to zero. That actually also presents its own potential problems, but I'm not sure we'll get onto them today. Um, I mean, there is a solution for them as well. Okay, so what does this mean in practice? Well, all the work we did, so these are called generalized linear models. And all the work we did with linear models, which actually seemed pretty boring, but it turns out it was worth doing all that work because everything we said applies here. So, just uh, paper size. I think we normally do A4 landscape. Let's try and keep consistent with that. So, what we found out before was that the uh, marginal likelihood of the 
linear regression, given the inputs and our uh, noise variance, was given by a Gaussian of this form. So T is a vector of all the um, target data and we defined k as x, x transpose. Well, we didn't, def I mean, I'm defining k as this. This is what we worked out k was. Yeah? So remember last time I sampled from uh, a Gaussian with that covariance and we saw these linear functions. Now, what I'm saying here is that you can, I mean, if you follow through the maths, and instead of using x directly, you use phi. So I'm going to use capital phi to represent our basis function. So what is phi? Phi looks like this. Um, very often we'll have constant of ones. We might have, or then we could have x. 1, x1, x2, going down to xn, and then we might have x. So this is a, a polynomial. That's one version of phi. We've looked at that. Or you could also have uh, sort of exp of... Uh, minus 2 x1 minus 1 squared, you know, so on and so forth. So it's a matrix, again, called the design matrix. So these are the basis functions we looked at second. But it's any matrix of basis functions. Now I want to look a little bit at at this form that we've been using, so we, it actually came out of saying, um, so what we said at some point is, we use, we use this identity. This is how it came into the um, uh, linear regression. And I sort of said, well, if we define x correctly, this is the case. Uh, let's see, why is that the case? Uh, so x is a matrix which is in the real numbers, uh, and it has n rows and p columns. So p is the <coughs> data dimensionality. Sorry. That's not right, is it? That was uh, this matrix. So this matrix here, okay, when you're checking, when you're doing linear algebra, hot tip number one, you can always do little checks to make sure what the dimensionalities are consistent. So this is uh, an n by p, sorry, X is an n by p matrix, so X transpose is a p by n matrix, and then that's being multiplied by an n by p matrix. You can tell this multiplication works because the inner dimensions match. Yeah? And what is the dimensionality of the result? It's given by the outer dimensions. That's always a sanity check. So mentally, I mean, this isn't really what happens. When I look at these things, I mentally cancel that out and think that that's therefore equal to a P by P matrix. You should always be looking at that to make sure things are consistent. You know, for example, that this can't work because that would be an M by P times a P by N. Sorry. I mean, uh, <laughs> <N by> <laughs> yes, that would work. That would work. <laughs> times an N by P 
and unless p is equal to n, that's not going to work. So that you should, you know, you actually end up seeing that these sort of forms are wrong. Of course, the other way around, xx transpose, xx transpose is an m by n, an m by p times a p by n. So it's an m by n matrix, which is what we saw last time. And it's giving correlation in the marginal likelihood between the data points. But let's look at an individual element of that matrix. So let's say we want to find the, the so we've got our um, big x dimensional matrix here. And then let's, uh, sorry, let, let's think of it as phi, actually, because this is also true for phi. I was going to write phi, but I don't need to write phi. I can draw it. So this is uh, this vector here is phi one. So if I look at this times its transpose, so this vector here is phi one. So that's obviously phi one. So it transposes it appears in there, and this is phi one standing on its end. And down here we've got say uh, phi i. And in here we've got phi r j transpose, so where the j and i are some random locations. So if I want to know the element of the result of, so this is phi, phi transpose is equal to this thing. If I want to know, which we're calling, let's call that k for the moment. We're actually missing the sigma squared term there. But if I want to know what k i j equals, hmm, what does k i j equal? Well, kij, the i and jth, the ith row and jth column of the big matrix is going to be given by taking. So I've done that the wrong way around. Let's call that i, <laughs> damn, and call this one j. I like to use i for rows and j for columns. That's why I'm going that way around. Is given by taking the ith row from phi which we're saying is little phi transpose, and doing an inner product with the jth column from phi transpose. So it's equal to phi i transpose phi j. Now that's an inner product. It's always the case in this covariance matrix. So that's useful because what that element is saying, okay, ignoring the diagonal, which we're saying is adding a sigma squared, that element is giving us, this inner product is giving us the correlation between the ith and the jth data point. So while we've specified it in terms of these basis functions, what we actually get out of it is the correlation between the ith and the jth data point. Now, if we weren't using basis functions, if just phi was equal to x, then we would find that kij is equal to x i x j if it was a unidimensional input and that's would be that covariance would lead to the linear function um, this is where the connection with kernel methods actually comes in because in a kernel method and we're not going to do the details of this and this is actually a gaussian process uh, which i will <coughs> touch on briefly i think in the last lecture in a kernel method you don't specify these basis functions. You specify this directly. So if you think about kij, is actually a function k of xi and xj. Because phi i is a function of xi, and phi j is a function of xj. So this is always true. It just happens to be a particular form. In this case, it's a particular form of function between these two which is the sum, well, it's the inner product. Uh, I don't want to write it as the sum because I haven't introduced that notation. It's, uh, which happens to be, in this case, phi of xi transpose phi of xj. What actually happens in a Gaussian process model, and I'm not giving you the details here, I just want to give you the instinct and the intuition, is here you've got a couple of you've got a design choice which is how many basis functions do you want to use and where do you want to put them yeah so we're saying 
perhaps we're using m basis functions where m has been 3 in the examples we looked at before, or 4 if you include the uh, constant offset. Um, and then we place these Gaussian bumps at minus 1, 0, and 1. Well, it turns out that what you can do is say, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to use, I'm going to set m equal to infinity, and I'm going to space these Gaussian bumps all along the real line. It's going to be infinite of them. So they, I'm not going to do the maths for this. It's just an intuition, because you've seen before that we've used these three fixed bumps. And if you do that, then basically you're saying, I've got as many basis functions as I like, all across the real line. And you can do the maths. The point is you can do the maths and take this limit, this interesting limit, and then you recover that kxi, comma, xj is equal to The fact that it also looks Gaussian is coincidence. This doesn't normally happen. And the only parameter you have is your L squared. But I think it actually comes out as 4L squared, according to the definition we used before, just from the maths. That's my memory of it. And your alpha at the front. Now, this guy is no longer separable into a phi xi, transpose phi xj, unless these vectors are infinite. So Trevor will have been talking to you about infinite dimensional feature spaces, yeah? Did he mention that when he introduced the support vector machine? Sometimes they do. They do this linear, they say, oh, we're doing, here's the, so you've got the linear classification, and you have the large margin thing going on, yeah? He talked about that. And then he said, okay, well, we can go into an infinite dimensional feature space. This is how they introduce it. I didn't see Trevor introducing it, but that's how typically they introduce it. And in an infinite dimensional feature space, everything's linearly separable. That's the support vector machine lingo. Well, that doesn't ever make any sense to me. Um, but here's a way of thinking about it, that what's actually going on is you're using these basis functions, and you're using infinite basis functions through this mathematical trick of what you really normally would do if you define the basis functions directly is this inner product. I haven't shown you the mathematical trick, and I don't expect you to be able to demonstrate how that goes or anything like that. I'm just trying to give you the intuition that this is possible, and this is why a Gaussian process is so powerful, because you go from this state of having, what's wrong with this picture? Three basis functions. What's wrong with this picture? I get a data point here. What's going to happen? It's always going to be zero. There's no power. The only way you can do this is by such an enormous weight on one of these basis functions. Because there is a little bit of, you know, these tails are going off exponentially, quadratically to zero. Never going to pick that up. Never. I mean, it, the, the, the weight you would need is beyond the, uh, what your computer can represent uh, in in log space, it could represent it. See, basically, you never, if you look at samples from this, and we'll do that in a moment, if you look at samples from this system, you'll just see that these guys are all, you've got samples in here. We've already looked at a few of them, and maybe we'll do a few more in a moment on Octave. And there's no representational power here. Now, you might say, and also we could say with the polynomials, this is a similar problem to the one we got with the polynomials. So if, you, if you map your data, someone gives you a data set, and then what you might sensibly do is either put the basis functions where the data are, or in the polynomial case, you might scale the input space such that minus 1 to 1 maps to uh, the space where your data is. So if I get data... here, and it's at, so if these are my input locations, and there's some targets along here, and this is minus 10 to 10, well then, if I'm using polynomials, I would maybe map that down to be minus 1 to 1, so squeeze the data in, and if I'm using basis functions, I just make sure I've got basis functions covering everywhere of interest. That works lovely, doesn't it? Beautiful. Until someone brings a test point that they never told you about, and it's over here. You didn't see this at design time, 
So it's not being mapped into the minus one to one region for the polynomials. And in the other case, there's no basis function near it. So your prediction in the polynomials will be, whoa, a positive 25,000. Your prediction for the RBF will be zero. And both these predictions will be made with very high confidence. So what you need to do is have infinite basis functions that can take account of this. And that's what the Gaussian process trick is. So I think it's a, and it's the kernel trick as well. I mean, the kernel methods are doing this as well. Whenever you introduce a new data point in this region here, because there were infinite basis functions, one basis function pops up there, all ready for you, ready to go. It's pretty nice. Um, so let me try and illustrate that a little bit. And then we'll move on to PCA for the next lecture. So what I want to show first of all is I want to do phi, well, let's say uh, x is lin space minus 10 to 10 with 100 data points. Yeah. So now phi 1, we're going to say is minus 2 times x plus 1. So this was the first basis function we talked about. I think that's what it was. Yeah. Okay, I've got a problem. I've missed the times. Okay, phi 2. So that one's centered at minus 1 because bear in mind it's minus mu and here it's plus 1. So in this case, mu will make it 0. So that's phi 2. And then phi 3 will make mu plus 1. Therefore, minus minus 1 is <laughs> minus plus 1 is minus 1. Okay. So now I've got phi 1. So these aren't the data points. It's a little bit confusing that I've called it phi 1, phi 2, and it doesn't quite match to my definition because these are the columns. These are the different features of the data, not the different data points that I've just defined there. And as long as I defined x correctly, I can now do uh, the same thing I did before. So let's sample a new w. It's only three-dimensional this time. And let's do plot what y is. OK, so with those weights, exactly what we expected. It's going to 0 outside the region where we define the basis functions. Now, the cool thing I did, well, what I thought was cool, cool thing I did last time is to actually say we can use our definition of the marginal likelihood to define the covariance. So I, I've not put noise in yet, so I'm going to just put a little bit of noise in. Uh, how many data points do I use? 100. Okay, so this is K now. Now, what I want to do is, is show what K looks like as an image. Apparently, I can't. Oh, there we go. So what we see immediately on K is because these basis functions are only active in the middle, you get strong correlations between points along the diagonal and then zero correlation between other points. There's a very small diagonal term here going all the way down, which is coming from the noise. But the dominant component of K is coming from these basis functions. And it sits in the middle there. OK, now we're going to sample from it. Uh, that's just to get the Gaussian sampler. So the, the mean of the Gaussian I'm going to use is 0. Covariance is K, and let's take 100 samples. Okay, that's confusing. <laughs> let's take 50 samples. Okay. So I think now if I do plot X, comma Y transpose with any luck, what do we see? With a little bit of noise, we see a bunch of different functions that are all sampled from this covariance, but they're also sampled from this basis function prior. Yeah? Where are they all active? Between 
minus two and a half and two and a half. Nothing going on in the middle bits. Okay, we can do the same thing by setting phi to be equal to one x x squared x cubed x to the four. Or maybe we can't. <laughs> Not one. Uh, Okay, doing the same thing here, and now again I'll do the k is equal to with this new phi, and let's image it again. Whoa! Freaky. What's going on is as we move away from the zero, this, there is structure in here, but basically it's completely wiped out. Let's look at what the scale of this image is. 1 times 10 to the 8. So there's a sort of correlation of 1 times 10 to the 8, an anti-correlation actually. Well, no, there's a correlation here of 1 times 10 to the 8. It's not an anti-correlation. A correlation of 1 times 10 to the 8 in this region here. Um, in here, things are much smaller. And now if I sample... Okay, no problem. That's what we get a bunch of activity outside the regime of where the data is. And look at our scale here, 20,000, because the variance in that region is 10 to the 8. Pretty nasty. OK, what's the solution for this? So, so this matrix is actually this is a function I'm using in NetLab, which is computing the square distance between data points. So just to remind you of this kernel function I'm now implementing, this thing actually is just the square distance between xi and xj. So another way of writing that is uh, xi minus xj and then sometimes we write this as the Euclidean distance, like that. So it's the square distance between the ith and the jth point. I have to take my word for that. And I'm using this function to compute that square distance. Uh, so if I image that, Gone. You see that the distances along the diagonal are zero, and as you go between points, the so minus ten point and the ten point uh, and the point on the other side here, the distances are going up. If we do the color bar, we should see something like uh, four hundred. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Bang on. Because the distance between the point at minus ten. And 10, so this point here is, they're 20 apart, square distance, 400. Okay, so that's the square distance. And what we're going to do now is say that k is equal to the xp of minus the square distance divided by 2. And that's all I need. Uh, no, I'll put in the noise. So I'm not doing that phi transpose phi anymore. It's all being done in one function that isn't separable. Uh, 1e minus 4 times i of 100. And now, here comes the funky bit. Cool. That to me is one of the coolest things in machine learning. I mean, maybe you don't find it that cool. But I find that super cool. What we've just done is using maths, which I didn't show you, because you know it's more it's beyond the scope of this course, you can build infinite basis functions being placed all the way along the real line. And these infinite basis functions are now appearing all along the real line. So the samples we're doing are exactly the same. We have sampled an infinite dimensional weight matrix. And before, what we could do is sample three weights, multiply by the basis functions, 
and then see what the plot looked like when we add them all together. Here, we're sampling, we're not doing it directly. You know, we, there's two ways of doing it for the fixed basis function way. Sample w, and then multiply w times phi, and then look at the results. Or sample directly from phi, phi transpose, plus a diagonal, and look at the result. Both those things are equivalent. We, we proved that on Tuesday. Here, we're sampling directly in the phi phi transpose way, and if we wanted to sample in the w way, we would have to create a phi that had infinite columns and sample from a w which had infinite parameters in it. This is called a non-parametric model. You can't represent what's going on here with a finite number of parameters. And it's super cool because now it doesn't matter where you produce a data point. Your data may at the start be between minus 5 and 0. There'll always be modeling power at 10. Now, we're not going to go through, I think we won't have the time to go through how you do inference in Gaussian processes because it's slightly different. You can never work directly with this W. You're always working directly on the data. So the inference process is, is slightly more complicated. It involves just playing with Gaussians, but in a way that we're not covering in the course. Um, so the whole thing is just these Gaussian manipulations, again. But this is what's underlying a kernel method as well. So this thing here was the Gaussian kernel we've computed, that they call it, or the RBF kernel, or people call it the squared exponential. I call it the exponentiated quadratic. It's just something that looks like a Gaussian bump. Um, and it, it's derived from summing up infinite of these other guys here. Oh, and let's do the image of it, because that's a point. I've forgotten about that. Oh, have we got the, uh, I don't have the original samples, do I, anymore? Must have overwritten them. Okay, so let's get this guy up. So this was the kernel k we were computing with three basis functions. Now let's have a look at what it looks like for infinite basis functions. Okay, so uh, this is my octave proof that this is the infinite version of that. <laughs> You can imagine each of these basis functions there, there's three of them, you can see them very distinctly, but now we've got infinite of them, and they're being spanned out all the way down there, yeah? So what actually has to happen, one of the tricks you have to do when you use infinite basis functions is you actually have to downweight each basis function. You have to scale them down as you add them together. If you keep adding infinite things together, you just get infinite output. So you have to actually scale by... Uh, the number of basis functions you're using. So if you just scale this, what happens here is if you scale this guy by the number of basis functions you're using and then you start adding infinite of them, you eventually get this. But this object is actually a much more intuitive object to work with because this object is telling you what the correlation is between any two data points at any space. So if we look at what that is, it's actually a covariance, but a correlation is a covariance which is normalized along the diagonal. So this is a correlation as well. So this is giving a correlation coefficient. And it's saying that the correlation between the 100th data point, which is at minus 10, and the zero, first data point, which is at 10, is 0. There's no correlation. So if they are the same, it's just coincidence. But the correlation between two points which are very close together, 50 and 51, is very high. It's high correlation. What actually has to go on in this one, because there's a little bit of noise added, it looks like there's zero correlation, but there's a little bit of diagonal here, which means if you were to normalize it, I mean, it's zero along the diagonal as well. That's the point. It, with, if, you don't norm, if you don't add the diagonal, this matrix is zero along the diagonal. So when you normalize it as a correlation matrix, it's in the undefined what happens along the diagonal. So you actually have to add a little bit of noise. And once you've added a little bit of noise, you find that everything along the diagonal is 100% correlated but they're not correlated with the data points that have gone before because these basis functions don't exist. So they don't respond to what was going on next door to them. They just become zero. Any questions about, about that? Two parts to what I've been telling you. First of all, the thing you should know and understand and, and work out how to do is that this... Uh, let me just write it down. Because if you just replace phi 
I mean, it's not equivalent directly, but in our maths before, you get that the probability of the data given x, sigma squared O, and we've not been writing alpha. Let me move that to the right. Is a Gaussian over t with a mean of zero and a covariance of phi phi transpose plus sigma squared i. I would expect you to be able to derive that. Yeah? So I'm just trying to differentiate between what I'm teaching you as isn't this cool where you can go with this and what I'd expect you to be able to reproduce. So that bit I'd expect you to be able to derive and understand why that's derivable. Understand how a basis function's coming in, how they're related to the standard linear regression and what the maths is. The next bit that I've told you about the fact that you can say, well, this representation of, okay, this I would expect you to know for sure, because it's just def definition. And actually, I'm missing an alpha there, aren't I? But the fact that then you can have this sort of representation, you should also be able to understand where that's coming from and how it relates. But how you then go from that, I mean, I want you to know that the relationship exists, but how you go and go, and go from that to this bit where it's just kxi, comma, xj, I mean, that is different for every basis function set you use. What I hinted at is the point that um, if, it's, if you're using these RBF basis functions, you get something that looks like this. Yeah? Uh, yeah, if you start with the L, I mean, it depends how you define L. Yeah, but basically, typically we define it like this. But if you started off by defining the basis function xi as being uh, x minus mu, ah. So this is the multivariate case. To write the multivariate case down, you have to have a, a mean vector that is the same length as x. If you start off by saying that's 2L squared, I believe, I can't remember exactly, I think this is right, um, then that goes to 4L squared. But if you start off by saying that's 2L, you get, uh, that's just L squared, you get 2L squared there. You're not having to worry about the math there. Um, and, and what you're doing here, in effect, is a few different ways of, of deriving this. But one of the ways of deriving this is you start is you place a prior over mu, which is Gaussian, and then you work out what the functions must be if mu is Gaussian, and then you drive the variance of the prior and the number of samples you take to infinity, and you keep the scale down. But you know I won't. I won't expect you to reproduce that. What I do expect you to understand, though, is the relationship between these things, that this is like an infinite dimensional version of that. Um, and that's what a kernel matrix is as well. So my um, understanding of these things is, is far more based on the fact that I want to um, think about Gaussians. So I don't tend to talk about kernel matrices as feature spaces and that sort of things. I just think of them as Gaussian covariances. But perhaps in the wider community, and certainly in the support vector literature, this same object has the same relationship, and people talk about it as a Mercer kernel, and they use it for doing nonlinear classification. It underpins the support vector machine. Um, so there's an important connection there between two fields, one which is defining everything probabilistically, and the other which is defining everything in effect as an optimization. But they have this, they're using the same trick. And actually, it was independently derived within those two fields at about the same time. I'm not derived, discovered, it was known already. But it was independently introduced into machine learning pretty much at the same time, about 1996, by those two different fields in those, with those two different explanations. OK, so 
that's sort of the end of the first lecture, but I'm going to, I'll stop the recording. <laughs>